Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of the Great War, and it's week 97, and it's the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy versus the German Imperial Navy. I've been talking about this, wondering when the hell it was going to happen, because I could not remember when it happened. Looks like it's happening this week. So, time to see the German Imperial Navy having taken way too long to press the advantages that they had and lose their entire navy. I think if they had done this maybe earlier in the war, there were plenty of prime opportunities. The German Imperial Navy could have secured some victories over the Royal Navy, as I've pointed out in a couple videos. Uh, there were a couple times where the Royal Navy was not... Uh, wouldn't have been as sent like was more spread out and probably wouldn't have been able to handle the german imperial navy uh in those first couple years but now 19 <laughs> now we're well into the british blockade the royal navy's got their shit under control i think the german imperial navy is gonna get pretty handily smashed here and because i can't remember exactly how close of an outcome the battle of jutland was so i'm just gonna assume Germans get smashed. Uh, before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you join the Discord and follow me over at Twitch. Okay, got it? Good. Let's dive in. Since the beginning of the war, the two most powerful navies in the world had failed to decisively engage. The British Navy yep. instead blockading the Germans to deprive them of supplies, the Germans harassing international shipping with U-boats. But that changes this week when mighty ships clash. Whoa. 100 years ago this week was the Battle of Jutland. Jutland. I'm going to keep saying Jutland the American way. Hoorah. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week at Verdun, the French tried and failed to retake Fort Douaumont, even though they had managed to achieve air superiority there. And the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army continued its advance in Italy in the Trentino Offensive. A look there first today, as that offensive continued this week. Now, Within two weeks of the initial attacks, Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna had managed to get a new army of 180,000 men to the Trentino, and the Italian 5th Army would guard the valley... Good job, Cadorna. You know how to move troops around. He's figured out first grade. He's, fig he's, he's graduated first grade. I'm so proud of him. ...hopefully to prevent the Austrians from spilling out onto the plains of Veneto. But this week, the Austrians took Arciero, just a few kilometers from the plains. Asiago soon fell as well, and Cadorna exploded heads in the government by saying that if enemy pressure continued, he would order a full-scale retreat almost to Venice. Maybe if you were a competent commander, Cadorna. This motherfucker's a gaslighter. He's just like, it's not my fault, I'm a dumbass. It's your guys' fault. 30,000 Italian <laughs> prisoners had been taken so far. The week also saw some action on the Western Front. The endless meat grinder at Verdun was still in full force. But further north at Ypres, the Battle of Mont Sorel, in older sources sometimes called the Third Battle of Ypres, began on June the 2nd and saw two German attacks that penetrated the British lines 700 meters on a three kilometer front. The road to Ypres was now open and undefended. Dun, dun, dun. The real news this week, though, was at sea. Both the British and German fleets were by this time becoming more aggressive. Commander of the British fleet, Sir John Jellicoe, such a British name, wanted to trap the German high seas fleet, and his opposite number, Reinhard Scher, in a very, very German name too, was trying to force a mistake. Scher sent his fleet into the. Wait, hold on, how old is Scher? 1860. Oh, Jellicoe, older. Skagerrak like to attack years. any British light forces and shipping there. But the 16 German battleships and six pre-dreadnoughts, five battle cruisers, 11 light cruisers, and 63 destroyers also... Oh, this is a big battle. I didn't think they brought that many ships. I wanted to come into contact with the British Grand Fleet, hoping to break it and the naval blockade of Germany. However, aided by the intelligence operatives of Room 40, who decoded German wireless signals, Jellico was forewarned and sent out his fleet. But the British were, in fact, heading into a trap. There were nearly a score of U-boats waiting for them. But Cher would be disappointed, since the ocean is big, and the Grand Fleet, 28 British battleships, oh. 9 battle cruisers, 34 light and oh. armored cruisers, and 78 destroyers, oh. passed them unobserved. 
How the fuck does that many ships get past? Huh? I understand the seas are big, right? They are deceptively large. But, but still, you would think that, like, the Germans would have had, you know, their submarines a bit, like, spaced out in a way that maybe they wouldn't have met. Huh? How does a fleet that big get passed by unknown? Also, the Germans, what are you thinking you can take on 28 British battleships? You that confident that your battleships are that much higher quality than the British? The Battle of Jutland would bring four leading admiral skills into play. Cher and Franz Hipper for the Germans, Jellico and Sir David Bates. <laughs> I love this little uh, scene right here. It's just like, it gives me like, um... Fucking WWE kind of vibes. Smackdown! For the British. The enemies made contact when both sides went to check out a merchant ship that happened to be sailing between the fleets. Firing between cruisers kicked off at 2.28 in the afternoon. So they started shooting at each other with a fucking merchant right in the middle of them? That's fucked up, dude. ...of May 31st, 1916, and the Battle of Jutland had begun. Hipper and his battle cruisers headed south, trying to draw Beatty in to Cher's main fleet, still unseen. Beatty followed, aboard his flagship, the Lion. Fire opened between them at 348. The Lion was hit and burst into flames and would have sunk if the magazine hadn't flooded and put out the fire. Hmm. The British Indefatigable was hit by two... Britain, what fucking name is that Indefatigable? What the fuck? That's a stupid name. Two 11-inch shells from the German... Can hardly pronounce it. Bonderton? I have no clue what the fuck that means, but at least I can pronounce it. And it's not even in English. Britain, what the fuck? Bonderton that blew up the whole ship and killed all except two of the ship's 1,019 sailors. Then the Queen Mary was hit and blew to pieces. 1,266 men were killed. Beatty seemed unmoved. And here's the reaction of his flag captain, Alfred Chatfield. I was standing beside Sir David Beatty, and we both turned around in time to see the unpleasant spectacle. The unpleasant spectacle. That's one way to word it, sir. The thought of my friends in her flashed through my mind. I thought also how lucky we had evidently been in the lion. Beatty turned to me and said, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today, a remark that needed neither comment nor answer. There was something wrong. What was wrong was that the British battlecruiser armor was not thick enough to handle the German shells. Oh, so that's why the Germans were so confident. And once a shell had penetrated the hull, inadequate anti-flash precautions meant that a flash could rip straight down to the magazine with terrifying results. No ship on Earth could survive explosions like that. Soon, Hipper had led Beatty almost into Cher's fleet, but Beatty's second light cruiser squadron was scouting ahead and spotted the long line of German battleships. Beatty actually reacted like lightning, reversing course immediately and heading back towards the Grand Fleet. And Cher didn't realize that every minute he headed north brought him closer to Jellico and his massed ships. Beatty, however, sent Jellico no useful reports about Cher's whereabouts, and soon Jellico's starboard column was upon the Germans. The first cruiser squadron under Rear Admiral Sir Robert Arbuthnot aboard the defense. I have a feeling he dies today. There's just, I just have a sneaking suspicion that this man is about to die. Came under heavy fire, and in a few seconds, the defense was sent to the bottom of the sea. Yeah. Soon, though, Jellicoe's battle cruisers were showering shells upon hippers, and because of the light and the mist, the Germans could not see them to fire back. But just for a few moments, the mist cleared, and the Germans rained fire on the Invincible. The British naval maxim that speed would be our armor was put to the test and found wanting when the Invincible exploded at 634. Only That's a big-ass explosion. Holy fuck. Six men survived out of 1,032. Ooh. But Jellicoe's dreadnought battleships were now in a long line, blasting the exposed vanguard of the German fleet, causing serious damage. I really like this animation that they're going with here, like to showcase the positioning of the, well, mainly the positioning of the ships and the movement of like the 
I like it. Cher Makes ordered it easy a to turn picture. movement to starboard that the Germans had practiced, where the rear ship would turn first and the successive ships up the line follow suit, and the Germans soon disappeared from sight. Jellico did not follow. He changed course and put himself between the German fleet and its base at Wilhelmshaven. And when Scher turned his ships again, they were again headed directly for the British, and they came under heavy fire. He turned his battleships away and ordered his battle cruisers to cover the retreat. They took terrible damage, the kind no British battle cruiser could have withstood. Hmm. But the Germans had better armor and were better subdivided below into watertight compartments. The Germans got away, but the Grand Fleet was still between the High Seas Fleet and its port. And when darkness fell, the question was, could Cher evade the British by night and return home? Since several of his battle cruisers were near to sinking, Cher took the shortest route via Horn's Reef. But Jellico didn't know this, and based on his last reports received, he thought the northern Frisian coast was the likely German route. So Jellico headed there. Ooh, this painting is very cool. With his destroyer flotillas following five miles behind to cover the Horn's Reef Channel. So Jellico's destroyers crashed into the German fleet, but the British, unlike the Germans, did not have properly shuttered searchlights, no star shells, and pretty much no nighttime identification signals. So they were really wary of firing on the black shapes heading towards them in the darkness in case they were their own ships. Oh, and nobody told Jellico with his mighty dreadnoughts five miles ahead what was happening. Huh. The British did manage to destroy the pre-dreadnought Palmerin, killing her crew of 844, but the high seas fleet swept past the British in the night. They didn't destroy the destroyers? Ah, that was a missed opportunity. The battered and bruised German battlecruisers, some even incapable of attack, limped through the British columns and were sighted several times, but none of the dreadnoughts opened fire on the incredulous Germans. The Grand Fleet sailed on, preparing for a new battle at dawn that would not happen. Scher reached Wilhelmshaven in the early afternoon. The Germans lost one battle cruiser, one pre-dreadnought, four light cruisers, and five destroyers. Really not much at all. Destroyers. The British lost more, three battle cruisers, three armored cruisers, and eight destroyers. So this is, yeah, I'd count this as a German victory. Well, unless we go by percentages, if we go by percentages, uh, the the Germans probably would have lost more in that regard, but based on your number, British lost. 1,551 German lives were lost against 6,094 British, and the Kaiser commented that the spell of Trafalgar is broken. But here's the thing. The German fleet did not again seek out battle with the British fleet, and Scher wrote to the Kaiser about the battle that real victory could only be achieved by sending U-boats to sink British merchant ships. So the status quo would continue, which for Germany actually meant a strategic defeat. And we come to the They had a good... Okay. So even after the Battle of Jutland... Jutland I don't know the fuck you want to pronounce it. The Germans actually continued to have... At least in 1907, 1916. By 1917, probably not. 1918, definitely not. Because that's when they could also have the American Navy in. Um, but 1916, it sounds like the Germans could have done some good, damn good damage on the Royal Navy and possibly even broken the blockade, but they never tried. They, they went to one battle, suffered some, say, heavy losses. But ah. to the end of hmm. another week, the Austrians on the move in Italy, the Germans blowing holes in the lines at Ypres and a gigantic naval battle in the North Sea. And that battle was a real blow for British prestige. I'm going to end today with an observation about the press and propaganda during the war, which we've talked about before. But you can really see it in action this week as the British Admiralty released one communique about the battle and then another with a different spin, thanks to Winston Churchill, hmm. which painted things a bit rosier. The upshot of this was scenes like Vera Britton in her London hospital saying, were we celebrating a glorious naval victory or lamenting an ignominious defeat? The fuck does ignominious mean? We hardly knew. Each fresh edition of the newspapers obscured rather than illuminated this really quite important distinction. By this point, though, 
nobody really knew what was going on anymore. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about what And that was the Battle of Jutland. Royal Navy versus German Imperial Navy, the Great War, week 97. Got really nothing to add here at the end. This was a good episode because we had an exciting battle that allowed us to actually have a, de you know, it's a decent discussion here around the Battle of Jutland. You know, we can talk about uh, theories for what may have been had the Germans pressed the advantages that they had on the sea. But unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, they did not. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.